one of the people that we've, uh, that's been quoted here a couple of times, or we've heard his, his name dropped, is Jerry Lynch, and Jerry's the Chief Sustainability Officer of, for General Mills. And one of the things that uh, and Jerry uh, has been quoted in saying is uh, relative to General Mills' goals for greenhouse gas reductions, he said that sustainability is a business imperative. And um, those of us who work in the area of, of soils and soil health know that uh, that's, uh, that's an important foundation for sustainability. And so we've, uh, we've extrapolated on that and uh, created a panel discussion around the concept that, that soil health is a business imperative. Now to do that, um, what we've done is we've invited uh, four people who are uh, personally engaged in activities around soil health. Uh, some of them from uh, the uh, producing, uh, producer sector, some of them from around the corporate sector, and um, they're going to uh, be here to offer their perspectives on this idea of soil health as a business imperative. So what I want to do very briefly, this is, this is how this is going to work. I'm going to, I'm going to just very briefly introduce each of the panelists, uh, very brief. You've got their bios in there. But then I'm going to turn to them and ask each of them to take just one minute or thereabouts and just, just tell us, uh, again, just sort of a self-introduction about uh, who they are and their, their connection to soil health and this topic and uh, where it fits kind of in your organization. Uh, relatively brief, about a, a minute or so each. Uh, then I'm going to spend most of the next hour, probably on the order, I've, I've asked Sheldon, where's Sheldon? Sheldon's down here, he's going to keep me honest on the time. Uh, uh, about, just about an hour, a little bit less perhaps, maybe 55 minutes. And I'm going to, I'm going to start the discussion or, and, and try to keep it going anyway, I don't think I'm going to have to try very hard. Uh, with a series of questions, some of which I've sort of, I've told them some of the things that I'm going to ask uh, so that they're not caught off guard. But in many respects, this is going to be uh, sort of a freewheeling conversation. Um, what they say is going to prompt me to ask some other questions. They may end, they're going to ask each other questions. They're going to respond to each other. Uh, this is not going to be the lineup of talking heads and, and uh, that, that kind of a discussion. This is, this is really going to be a, a conversation amongst some, some professionals who know what they're talking about here. Um, after about an hour of that, then I'm going to turn to the audience, and um, you're going to be spectators to, a, to this conversation up to that point, but after about an hour, I'm going to bring you into it, and uh, you're going to have the opportunity then to engage any or, or all of our, of our panelists. And then um, I'm going to try to save a few minutes right at the end to allow each of the four to offer one final concluding thought or one, maybe uh, some, some point that they would like to have made in the preceding hour and they didn't get to, so they'll have an opportunity uh, to do that. And then um, we'll wrap it up. So the rules for the, for the panelists are is that they're, uh, they're, they're not allowed to lecture. Uh, their their, their uh, responses are to be conversational and uh, relatively brief so that um, there can be some interaction and, and some, some give and take on this. I don't expect them to agree on everything. Um, they, uh, 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 you should feel free to, to jump in. Uh, if somebody says something and you have a comment or a different perspective, um, we'll, we'll try to, and I'll try to moderate that. I guess the only thing um, that I would say is that for those of us old enough to remember Jerry Springer, uh, there will be no chair throwing. Um, I know that's disappointing to everybody here, but uh, that's probably my only, my only real rule in, in this thing. So that's how we're going to spend a little bit of time now uh, talking about soil health as a, as a business imperative. And so uh, our panelists, their, bi their bios are on page uh, 11 of the, of the program, but we have uh, Klaus Martins. Klaus has been farming for over 45 years. He and his family farm some 1,600 acres and a wide variety, variety of certified organic crops. And they own and operate Lakeview Organic Grain, which is a certified organic animal feed and seed business. So Klaus is here. Uh, and Klaus is also one of the uh, members of the board of directors for the Soil Health Institute. As is Larkin Martin, Larkin is here, and uh, she manages her family's row crop farm in Alabama, serves on the board of uh, a number of uh, organizations, including the Soil Health Institute, and we're, we're grateful to her for that service as well. Uh, John Wiebold is uh, there on the end, and he's the vice president uh, for One Global Sourcing, Agri-Food, supply management and responsible sourcing. He has the accountability to back Jerry Lynch up at General Mills um, on this uh, idea that uh, 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 sustainability and as we're saying, soil health is a, is a business imperative. And so uh, we're glad to, glad to have him here. And uh, last but not least is Rowan Atwood, who's 
the guy in the jeans, and, and that's very important uh, because he's the sustainability, director of sustainability for VF Jeans Wear, and he leads sustainability strategies for Wrangler and Lee and several other uh, brands of, uh, of, of apparel. So these are the folks. We've got some producers here. We've got some, some corporate people here, and um, we're, gonna, we're now going to uh, turn it over to them. So what I'd like each of you to do, and I think we'll just, we'll just start down at the end, John, with you and work our way back. Just a little bit more self-introduction, just a minute or so about yourself, uh, maybe a little bit about your background and where you fit in your organization. Sure, what you'd like sure. to say is to open. So you don't have to stand, we'll just sit. All right, perfect, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to represent General Mills today on this panel and to, uh, to engage with the folks that are up here. I'm looking forward to a great discussion. And I actually think that given our discussion at our small table over here, we're not going to have any chair throwing, and we might be radically aligned on a number of topics. So uh, I think it'll be a great discussion this afternoon. Um, my name is John Wiebold. I'm a vice president at General Mills. I'm an officer of the company. I've been with the company almost 17 years. Um, almost all of my time in the sourcing function, uh, I describe myself as a farm kid once removed. My grandfather was a farmer of about 1,000 acres in southern Minnesota. And I've been able to carry that forward through a job trading um, as a merchandiser with my first career stop, and then I've brought in some farm experience into, into my experiences at General Mills. Uh, Dr. Schaefer, you're exactly right. Jerry creates and I execute. That's kind of the work that we do in the organization. In our function, uh, our sourcing, uh, the raw materials that we buy account for about 52% of our value chain greenhouse gases that are emitted into the atmosphere. Um, and we spend um, multi, multi, multiple billions of dollars on raw materials around the world. And it's really my job, along with our sourcing function, to sustainably source about 40% of that spend in 10 primary raw materials around the world. So um, I spend a lot of time in the space. Thanks, John. Roy? Yeah, I also agree with John. I don't think there'll be any chair throwing, but I do say if we look awkward up here, it's because these things are <laughs> ill-designed. They are like throws. We didn't want to be talking heads, but we're talking shoulders. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So say, where's my high chair? I sort of feel well sequestered. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out what to do with my arms. Um, so my name is Rowan Atwood. I, I've been director of sustainability at Wrangler. I'm primarily going to be representing Wrangler of all the hats that I wear today. That's the, the brand that's taken the, the one seat here with our soil health platform, uh, and rightly so. Uh, been around since 1947, grew out of the cowboy cut gene and the ori original uh, rodeo gene. Um, we were originally blue belt overall, so we also have a deep heritage within the workwear community. Uh, we sell into farm and ranch, and it's, uh, it's a place that uh, is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, many of my coworkers come from that world, and uh, even one of our VPs uh, holds a couple titles, so that's pretty exciting. Um, I, I think the, the one thing that, that, that I want to share just here in this brief intro is that when I looked within my organization, and even though the sustainability platform within Wrangler is relatively new, I interviewed a lot of the senior leaders, what does this mean to you? What does sustainability look like for uh, an iconic denim brand? And it kept, people kept saying the same thing. You know, it's like, we take care of stuff. We take care of our people, we take care of our community, we take care of the land. And that became sort of our overarching mission statement is that we take care of, and, and I think it resonates really well with a soil health platform. It's maybe simple, but it's clear and it's direct, and it sort of resonates with uh, everything that we're trying to do on a program level. Thank you. Klaus. I'm Klaus Martins. Uh, I'm a family farmer. My uh, father came over with his uh, family and great-grandmother, and it's, it's amazing how much farmland in the United States is farmed with the descendants of this old iron grandmother who <laughs> brought her family over here in the period right after World War I. And I grew up milking cows and having grains on the farm. And after getting out of college, we uh, farmed according to how the land-grant system taught. We were using all of the conventional uh, inputs. We were pretty good at what we were doing. But we didn't have the best land in the country. In fact, New York has a bit of an identity problem. The people down in New York City think there's nothing, there's still Indians out when you get past Poughkeepsie. <laughs> and most of the rest of the country think we live in a concrete jungle. But there, there is farmland in New York. <laughs> and some of us are using it. So we're about an hour from Cornell. 
And we found in the 80s that uh, we were going to have to find a way to make, this, make our farm more profitable if we wanted to maintain a decent standard of living, raise our family and have them want to come back or enjoy living on a farm. We had lots of ideas, most of them were totally lousy, but we did find a niche in organic farming. And uh, it's been a great market for us. But also, and I think this is more important in our experience, is we've had a change in the climate. And the Northeast, according to our meteorologists, has had a 70 plus percent increase in intensity of rainfall. Our drought periods are much longer than they were when I was growing up. And our, um, our weather patterns kind of get stuck. And if we weren't farming uh, in a way that builds soil health, if we didn't have soil health to fall back on, I don't think we could be successful on our farm anymore. Uh, Larkin Martin, I am a seventh generation <laughs> farmer. Um, the first folks that I uh, aligned with got there in 1810, I think. That's pretty old in Alabama. Um, I would not be a farmer if I'd had a brother, but I didn't. <laughs> And I was the oldest girl when my father was diagnosed with cancer in 1990, and I moved back to the farm. And I've been doing, been managing the family farm since then, waiting to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. We raise, um, and my bio always concentrates on board, so I thought I would tell you about the farm. We um, farm about today about 7,000 acres, owned and rented land, 28 different FSA numbers. Our crop historically was dominated by cotton, or at least the last, well, 150 years. But um, lately, in the last decade or so, it's become much more diverse, not only in our farm, but in our area. In order of, of percentage, we currently raise corn, soybeans, wheat, cotton, peanuts. We have raised, in recent years, canola, sesame, and sunflower, and haven't been doing that this past year. We began no-till in the 90s as a response to some um, wind-blown issues um, and some early uh, cotyledon leaf cotton damage that was associated with sand blowing. Copied the, some, John Bradley was doing work in Tennessee on that and we mimicked that and brought it back. We've converted to minimum till now because of issues related to no-till and um, our harvesters, the weight of the harvesters in the, in the fall or anytime you do field work in wet conditions you create ruts and compaction that we haven't found a way to eliminate except with tillage in certain cases. We, um, we've done rye cover crops in the past and abandoned it for reasons I'm happy to explain. Um, we are all dry land, or, or statistically, we're, I think we have 7% irrigated land. It's really important. Soil health is vital to us because of the resilience that it imparts in the dry, sometimes very dry south. And we have, we farm 70% highly erodible land, so we care about erosion. So it's a critical issue for us, but it's, um, problematic in the adoption of certain things that we see mandated or that we see encouraged because locally they're less easy to adopt than some of the places where they were developed, so it's a challenge. Um, I look forward to the conversation. So let's, let's take it from your, your comments, Larkin, and we'll just go back down the road. It's interesting, we, I told them they could sit wherever they want and we segregated by producers, <laughs> corporate types. Um, <laughs> You know, I look at, the, look at the theme of our meeting, powering up our soils. You know, this panel is a about a business imperative. These are strong words. Um, is it, when you think about your organization, is it really a business imperative? When I think of business imperative, I mean, I, th I tend to think that, it, well, it must be an integral part of, like, your organization's strategic plan, or it, it's a must do in your organization. So let's, let's just go back, back down the row. I think you introduced it very well. Well, yes, it's a business imperative, but soil health, and I'll, this coming from a farmer, and not only from me and the vocabulary I'm accustomed to, but the vocabulary I speak with with my neighbors, we're accustomed to talking about fertility. We're not accustomed, it, we're, the, the word soil health is increasingly in the lexicon, but, but, but it's relatively new. What, where that intersects is productivity. And because soil health is a crucial part, we're beginning, beginning to understand of productivity. We used to just think about fertility, feeding productivity. Now we're realizing in more and more, and, and it, most farmers do, I think, that organic matter and biological health of the soil is also key to productivity. The business imperative from a person trying to earn an annual living and manage risk on soils is productivity because yield is ultimately what pays. Yield equals income. 
how does soil health improve or stabilize yields would be the topic. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's imperative. Klaus, what do you, what, what's your perspective on it? It's absolutely imperative and becoming more so because of issues with the climate. Another piece of who we are, we do farm 1,600 acres, and a lot of the land that we were able to rent was the land that uh, our more uh, fortunate or the ones that had been there longer neighbors figured wasn't good enough for them anymore, and they had walked away from it. In fact, the one farm that I rented, uh, I tell this story a lot, but the previous renter came to me and he said, let me tell you something about the old Vanderhoof place you just got. Nothing grows there except weeds. <laughs> and some of these uh, farms that we were able to rent very cheaply in the late 80s and early 90s uh, were definitely were going to put us out of business if we couldn't figure out what was wrong with them. Uh, these, this was land that had suffered from long-term declining soil health due to bad uh, farming practices. And also, and this is happening at the same time, and I'm going to plug in a, put in a plug for Cornell, uh, the vegetable industry was very important in upstate New York for processing vegetables. And we started finding that less and less of the land in New York was able to grow profitable vegetables. The vegetable yields were, had plateaued and were starting to collapse. And the farmers came to Cornell and they said, why are these yields tanking? Why can't we get the same crops that we used to get? And that started what became the soil health team and soil health initiative at Cornell. Mm -hmm. So we, we really cannot get production from some of these fragile soils if we don't build the health of that soil. That's good. So uh, business imperative, depending upon, I guess, who you would ask. And I just scan the audience to make sure my brand president isn't in the room. <laughs> because if you were to ask him that question, it would be about brick and mortar versus di digital and online and um, you know, shelf space and things of that matter. But when you think about those problems and what, what's going on in the challenge of retail, um, how do we solve it? How do we start to peel back that onion? What are the solutions that we're going to that we're going to, uh, you know, to utilize to, to, to solve it. And I'm thinking, what is the equivalent of fertility? It, it's, it's actually in the shape of a triangle. We, we call it a brand pyramid. Um, and we spend all bunch of time talking about our brand pyramid and what it means to be a brand. And what, what, is, what is our purpose? Uh, what is it that, that defines us? What is it that differentiates <laughs> us from our competitors? And when you start to peel that back, uh, there's this really critical piece about creating an emotional connection to consumers. And that's a little bit where that, that taking care of the land comes into play for us, is that uh, that's actually on, on our brand pyramid. We've got two places on the brand pyramid. Yes, the lower section and the upper section. That's very strategically mapped. There's a, it means different things in the quadrants. But um, two statements that, uh, that invoke this quality of taking care of the land. And I'm really proud that in our discussions that I was able to um, represent that point of view, that we need to have this component within the brand pyramid to authentically be Wrangler. And so from that perspective, as you start to peel back the onion and you start to say, what is our objective? I mean, farm is almost tier six for us in some cases, if you were to follow the supply chain. So it's pretty hard to, uh, to, uh, to demonstrate how that is the, the, the central business imperative. But when you talk about creating that emotional connection to consumers, what it means to be a brand, then I think the answer is yes, absolutely. That's interesting. Interesting job. I think that's a great lead in even for where we're at. We're a $16.5 billion food company, mostly known by our brands. And soil health for us is important, I think, on a number of fronts and imperative certainly to help us reach our public commitments that we've made in the sustainability arena. The biggest, the boldest one that we've made um, is to reduce our emissions across our value chain by 28% by the year 2025. We have to figure out how to put less carbon in the atmosphere as a supply chain, as a company. And when about 48% 45% of the greenhouse gases that we emit come from ag and transformation, dairy, row crop production, fruit and nut production that's going on around the world. We know the only way we're going to be able to modify our footprint is by working back at Farmgate and starting to figure out how to put carbon back in the soil. So we have to solve that problem. That's one place where it's an imperative for us. Um, and that's important for the credibility of our brands with our consumers. And it's certainly important relative to the commitments we've made because we've been held accountable and will continue to be held accountable 
by the NGO community that's out there. And we have some tremendous partnerships there and they've helped us move forward. The other place that it's important is we're quietly a very, very large natural and organic food producer. Um, Annie's and our brand Annie's is all about the sourcing proposition and bringing the sourcing proposition through transparently to consumers so that consumers trust what they're buying from you. Our work here is all about trying to, it is ensuring that we're maintaining good soil health. But more importantly, as we grow that business, we have to grow sources for raw materials. And the process of finding land in North America to transition from conventional to organic is a process of building soil health and stepping away from conventional practices. And our business is diverse enough and large enough that we can go down that path pretty effectively. And we've started to do that over the last 12 months. So I, you know, one could almost get a sense of a, of a little bit of a paradox here in that uh, earlier in the day, we, we heard a lot from several speakers about how many different kinds of organizations are in this soil health space. It just seems to have exploded in, in recent years. And, uh, and uh, Ron Nichols talked about in the communications aspect, uh, you know, how he can go to a cocktail party and people really get interested. And then the question comes, well, why aren't we doing more? Um, I hear all of you were kind of preaching to the choir here. We're all, we're all very much on board with this. I guess my question to you is, and maybe we'll start with you, Royan, is, is um, if, it's, if it's such a hot thing and everybody agrees that it's so great and, um, and, and we're, all, we're all in agreement, why, why is there still this lingering question, why aren't we doing more? What, what, why, isn't, why hasn't this caught on to the point that it's really just not a, not a, a point of debate anymore? So let's start with you and then we'll go to Klaus and then see where we go from there. Yeah, yeah one thing comes to mind immediately is just this, this idea that we have a, a really narrow definition of what sustainable product looks like, at least for, as it applies to apparel um, specifically. Uh, and, and I often find myself caught in between two different opposing viewpoints, uh, you know, GMO or, or maybe anti-GMO or and the organic community. Um, I, I've actually been personally researching this. I ask many questions to everyone that I meet. I, actually, the more solidified you are on one side of the camp, the better the conversation is, um, <laughs> including the Herbalife representative who's probably in the, the conference room down there. I don't know if you know Herbalife has got the big convention going on right now. Uh, made for great conversation about the parallel between new, personal human nutrition and soil health. Uh, I didn't get any work done on the plane. It was terrible. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think that uh, we, as we heard from the communications panel, this is the topic that seems to cut through the noise. It, it has the opportunity to, um, to, to unify uh, both sides of the camp. But why haven't we heard from it more? I, I, I think that um, it, it's it's this thing that we're just starting to awaken upon, maybe perhaps at least in the communication level. I'm excited. I feel like the fledgling in the room. I mean, I can, I can tell you about technical specs of apparel all day long, long and wash down characteristics of denim. Uh, I have a, a very broad role, but uh, I'm excited for this next wave of communication that we're about ready to embark on. You know, if, if 2011 and 2013 was the soil renaissance, I'm excited to be part of the, the 2016 to 2020 soil revolution. Let's, let me just open it up to, to any of you who want to answer this. What, why, why isn't this a non-issue? Why isn't this just so obvious that, that there is no, no debate or no discussion at all? Mark. Uh, on the farmer, at the farmer level, and this has been alluded to by several of the earlier speakers, I don't think there is an argument against it. I think there's excitement about it. What I think um, is in many cases missing is the what, where, and how in a practical way at, in your, on your farm, with your conditions and your crops, what do I do? In and terms how of do everyday I do everyday operating? Yeah, yeah. In, a, in a way that fits with the people and the machines and the soils mm -hmm. and the crops and, and, good, practical, and yeah. good practical advice, yeah. a how-to manual on how to improve your soil health that works wherever you are. I, I think that's missing. You're, you're nodding a lot. <laughs> yes, this is, uh, I think one of the interesting parallels is it's like human health. We tend to define human health in terms of the absence of being sick. In fact, we don't think about it until we get sick. And I think to a large extent, soil health was very much the same thing. As long as the soil was putting out good yields and it was profitable, of course our soil is health. But there were changes taking place that many of us were disturbed by, but we just didn't know what to do about it. 
And I, I think we had to finally come to a, a tipping point, and I believe the tipping point was brought on quicker by the changing climate, mm -hmm. which created more biotic stresses, which started to expose these uh, problems in our production system. It's, uh, and a farmer has to survive this year in order to be sustainable next year. So to a large extent, uh, farmers were responding to stress by reducing the long-term productivity of their farms to stay alive by maintaining the short-term productivity. It's really hard to look in the future. Yeah. Did you have a comment on, on this? Well, I think I'd add, from our point of view, it's that it's an economic challenge. Right, so I think about this happening at, at, at FarmGate, and there needs to be really effective ways to be able to monetize the work, because there's cost to it. And the value chain doesn't always recognize the work that's being done there because it's relatively free to pollute in, the, in North America, and some would even say it's profitable to pollute in North mm -hmm. America if you think about our ability to dump gas into the atmosphere in an unrestricted fashion, more or less. Um, if we can figure out how to create more economic models and more economic opportunity for the producers yeah. to go after this at scale, I think we move from a push system to a pull system in terms of, of the uptake of, of the behaviors, of the practices at FarmGate. Something that I wanted to pick up from what Brian said, you, you were talking about how this fit into the, the branding effort and uh, where this, and that's become sort of customer perception, uh, customer demand. Mm -hmm. You know, customer means different things to different people. I worked for 32 years with, in, in ARS, and we were always talking about our customers, and I often got con confused exactly who those were. But uh, in, in your sense, I think, as I look across, there might be, you know, you might have different perceptions uh, or, or ideas about who your customers are. How important is this to your, wh whoever your customers are, uh, Mark? And, uh, well, how important is this to them? And let's just, I'd, I'd sort of be interested, you've already touched on it, but I'd like to hear from the others about customer, how important this is to what you, whoever your customers are. So I have two customers uh, by category that I can immediately think of. One are, in the cases where we rent land, my landlords are customers that I have to please and, and to have, continue to have the opportunity to farm their land. They are mildly interested in this topic for the most part. It depends, they're individually, there's variation. Um, and how many are there? 22 okay. different people. Um, some that live down the street from their property and some that have never seen it. So this is not a monolithic block? It's not a monolithic block of all ages, of all education levels and personal levels of sophistication and interest. Um, and so but that's, that's sort of a secondary. My, my customers, the people that I sell to, frankly don't care because they I raise commodity crops and I'm selling in a global market at a tiny margin and the only thing that pays me is volume. And if I'm lucky to market, unfortunately the markets crashed today for those of you that didn't. I didn't sell corn yesterday after the market. But that's those, my, my customers, my local grain elevator cares about alpha toxin, but they couldn't care less about the soil health of where it came from. Um, cotton buyers care a lot about length, strength, color, micronair, to the extent that soil health helps me produce a more uniform or, or attractive crop. I may know that in an agronomy, agro my customers couldn't care less. You, would you agree with that, Klaus? Uh, I've shifted from your position to a different one because our customers were paying the lowest price they possibly could, and it wasn't enough that I could make a good living with it, so we went after another group of customers. And because we're going after a, a very select group of customers, our sort of organic certification is a great marketing tool. Uh, these customers ask a lot of questions. They want to know how we're farming. And I don't believe we would have access to those markets if we weren't at least being credible in how we were stewarding our soil. Mm -hmm. But what's even a larger issue, let's take that off the table, because when we switched to certified organic, we had some tools taken away from us that we had been using to manage our crops. And in the absence of those tools, the only way to manage the problems, the agronomic problems that we were encountering was to build soil health. So it, we were kind of put in, into a position where we had to figure out how to deal with disease, how to deal with all these issues in soil health that were being discussed today because we didn't have the easy Band-Aid. Yeah, yeah. 
you you touched on where this fit in. I'd like to I'd like to hear from John. Mm -hmm. um, you know, relative to customers, how important is this to your who, whoever your customers are? Yeah. So I think it 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 kind of spans a spectrum. So clearly, if we look at consumers, there are some that care tremendously about it. An organic consumer that's looking for very specific things in their food, they trust the brands, very important to them. Um, a kid 15 to 24 that's eating Totina's pizza rolls, not going to hit the radar screen in most cases. <laughs> Go figure. So, so from a, and that's relevant because it gets back then into, you know, kind of our traditional customers. Walmart is spending significant resources in the space to understand what their footprint looks like. They care. Um, dairy is, to me, picking up more and more steam in terms of what consumers want to see from purity and dairy, and therefore customers are asking more questions in the dairy space. And we have very big customers like Kroger who are very active in the space on dairy. Um, figuring out where soil health fits in to help them move against the stories that they need to be able to tell, um, there's opportunities in all those places. But they're engaged, and they're asking about it. I, I, Go ahead. Yeah. I don't, we don't have beef cattle, but I would be interested in answering, because that's a real, it's a commodity type product, but soil health may be a grass fed, for instance, and other things may or may not yeah. be more germane to the buyers in that market. I don't, I don't know if somebody in the audience may. You expanded, you expanded customers, though, to include people you're responsible to, like your Yeah, and so I, I, I mentioned the landlords, landlords because I'd like to continue farming their property, and so I have to please them as a yeah. steward, and they mm. should care, yeah. and I like to brag about what we are doing. Some of them don't care. Um, we've, that, that topic's been generally mentioned several times today as an audience for this topic and for soil health, and that's a good thing, um, as long as their expectations are informed and not unrealistic. But, but that's the real customers who you sell your product to. In the case of most commodities that we raise, it is, it's an unrelated topic. I'd like to bring up someone else that we're responsible to, and uh, we have a neighbor, it's an old order Mennonite leader, and he said something that really made me think ever since he said it. And he's farming all no-till. He's not certified organic, but he's using a lot. He's using cover crops on every bit of his farm. And he said, yeah, we lost a lot of yield by being no-till last year. And I could make a lot of money and could tolerate the soil loss and the degradation of my farm as long as I need it, but my grandchildren can't tolerate it. Mm. So, you know, one of the other groups that we're responsible to in using customer as a loose definition is future generations. It's the next, next generation, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, is it fair to say that in terms of making decisions about this, that the two of you, the two producers, are kind of at the top of your food chain? You, you're making decisions about whether or not to to make some people happy, but ultimately, is it fair to say the decision rests with you? On, on our operation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, same with you. And my son. Yeah, okay. So. I want to modify my statement. Okay. <laughs> Theoretically, it rests with me. Yeah. Um, and, and this goes back to, I should have mentioned this in the bio, I, I can drive the implements uh, if I have to, but if the least skilled operator is doing so if I'm in, char if I'm in a big machine. Mm -hmm. So other people do that stuff and other people that know a lot more and are better at it than I am. And, and I'm not always there. I'm more often at an office at a desk at our size and in our scale. And so um, I can ask that it be done. I can request. I can be bossy about it. But it, I'm not doing it. And if they don't believe it's important, and I'm at this meeting giving a talk and something you needs to get, it it'll get plowed, for instance, because, well, we mm -hmm. had to. Yes. And I have to defer to the skill and, and management ability of people when I'm off doing stuff like this to make practical on-farm decisions. So yes, I'm technically in charge, but for it to really work, I have, they have to believe it too. Mm -hmm. and, that is, and, I, and I want to acknowledge that challenge on, on farms of scale. Yes. Because so, they can make it fail if they, if they don't think it makes sense. They being highly skilled, motivated employees who disagree with the idea. So that will, that's great because I was gonna to go to the two corporate yeah. guys next. Now, Rowan, you already, you already implied that there are people within the up and down of your organization that maybe believe in this a little bit more than others. I won't press you on that. <laughs> but I would, and we know that Jerry Lynch is, is, is committed to this, but how, 
you know, I guess where, where, where Larkin has, has pointed me is where within those organizations, how, you know, how, how far up and down the organization is this an important issue? And for those that aren't, and I can involve you in this question too, for those who, who aren't really all that enthused about it, why do you think that's the case? Is it, you know, in your case, it's, it may be just a matter of practicality of what's facing us in this next half hour. But what's, you know, how, how pervasive is the, for lack of a better term, commitment to, to soil health in, your, in, the, in the two corporations? And for those maybe higher leaders that maybe you you're, may have some skepticism, what's, what's the issue? So, John, we'll start with you. I, okay. I mean, I know we, we know you got you have at least one sure. very strong champion, but there sure. must be must be some others, perhaps. Well, well, we do, and and you know, Jerry gets to you know set a lot of the strategy in terms of where we go, but all our the strategy is always bought into by other leaders. So we're big. We have thirty nine thousand employees globally. I mean, so imagine there's some that know nothing about it. Of course, that's the case, and there's others that are deeply into it. In the C suite, our executives are bought in. Our CEO, Jeff Harmoning, note has sustainability on our corporate goal statement for the year. We have to advance our sustainability, our sustainability footprint and soil health is how we will get that work done um, as we start down the GHG path. Our supply chain knows it's very important. So uh, the supply chain leaders, the 10 or so vice presidents that are working on this, um, along with John Church, who, who leads our global supply chain, knows this is incredibly important. And from there, it starts to fraction, fractionate a little bit. You move up into the brands, and we have some brands that are fighting for their life right now. It's highly competitive in the space, and what's important is making the next quarter and making sure you hit your numbers. Um, soil health isn't, it's not hitting the PowerPoint in that, in, in that business's discussions right now. And so, um, when you're as large as we are, you see all parts of it. But at the C-suite level, we know that for us to continue to live another 150 years as we've just celebrated our 150th, um, this is a place we have to play. And there's commitment to doing it. Klaus, did you uh, I, had an, I had an employee who could really illustrate this problem. He, uh, when we switched to organic, he was very much a part of the, figuring out how to do it. He was an extremely skilled equipment operator. But he had a, a little drawback. He would go to the coffee shop. And at the coffee shop, if you plow deeper than your neighbor, you're doing a better job. And if you flip the soil so it's blacker than the, <laughs> the other guy, you're doing a good job. And you have to blow a little more smoke than the other guy to have bragging rights. And what we were running into was noticing that our soil had some problems because of the tillage. And when I would tell him to run that, put that plow up out of the ground, as soon as I turned my back, he would and drop it in a little deeper. Of course, then we get comments in the fall like, why is this stuff so nasty when I get done plowing it? And by fall, it's mellow, and then next spring, it's nasty again. And of course, I was thinking to myself, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. And uh, hmm. education was a huge issue in dealing with this, but the peer pressure of, you know, what does everyone else do was a barrier, and I had to let this person go. And hmm. to me, it's very important to have employees who are committed to soil health and who understand that it's key to keeping their jobs viable. Interesting. Ron, do you, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, I would just add, um, you know, even though the brand presence in the room, he, he does have a lot of support for the platform. I mean, he, he and the entire leadership team, they get reported on the progress of this, of this uh, platform every six weeks and uh, approved wow. a, a public-facing goal uh, for us to engage our, our supply chain and our, and our farmers uh, that, that, make, that grow our cotton. So um, the organization is definitely behind it, but I, I would say that you know, kind of linking back to the, the customer question in a certain way, it, it is how well does this resonate with the customer that helps drive some of that business discussion. And when we think about consumer insight study and, and we ask the very simple question, do consumers care? That's a little tricky. Um, you get a mixed result. Sometimes it doesn't reflect in how they purchase. Um, we've taken great strides, actually, to understand that in more complexity. So what are the psychological stage gates of a consumer? 
um, so that uh, we can follow them that, through that journey. Do they, are they not looking at that? Are they stuck in the clouds and they're just not thinking about it? Are they um, starting to put some pieces together? We call that the pre-contemplative phase. Mm -hmm. Are they actually taking action? So they're actually starting to do things or, or are, they, um, are they actually maintaining their, their commitment to sustainable purchases? So there's these five stage gates to uh, a possible consumer psychology. How can we follow them across that psychology and then actually change the messaging so that it influences and moves them down that stage gate? So I, I think we're taking great strides to, to try and understand that better. Because in the past, this, this simple question, you know, would you buy this sustainable product? It, it doesn't translate well. We've had to find ourselves to create new tools to be able to speak to marketing, consumer insights, and the sales team. Yeah. Can I go backwards a minute Yo. on the customer question? Yeah, please. Because as I sit here, I was unwise and unobservant by saying, my customers don't care, my customers buy commodities. Both of these guys could be buying what I grow. Yeah. But the, the supply chain in between doesn't care. The, 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 the infrastructure mm. that marketing has developed over time for commodities, commingles and, and lo identities lost. And so they may care, and they are the ultimate customers of both cotton and some of the grains we grow. But in between, the, the value chain, the supply chain mechanisms um, don't differentiate the way it flows through. And that's, it's an issue associated with this for, for identification and, like and the challenge they face as, yeah. as ultimate buyers of the product that want to differentiate. I'd like to follow this a little further because of our special market. Uh, we found that as we started working on soil health, that it impacted the quality of the grains, the quality of the beans that we grew. And some very discerning customers, including some high-end chefs, started noticing that these things had better flavor. And then they came and wanted to know, why did this particular product taste better when I fixed it than the one that I bought somewhere else? And that suddenly created a demand and created an imperative that we hadn't expected. Yeah, I also want to touch on Larkin's point because I, I think that really resonates with me. Like for as a cotton grower, when cotton reaches 60 cents a pound, that's kind of like break even. Yeah, our organization. 65. 65. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say 70. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> we rejoice when it hits 60 cents a pound, right? Because that means that maybe break even for you. <laughs> it's very beneficial to us. The, the cost of goods is, is, is then therefore reflected in that, and, and we get better margin. And, and that's just a terrible system. It, it, it feels broken. I mean, the delta between 60, 60 and 75 cents and all the soil health practices that we want to implement in between that we would like to see to be able to tell that story to consumers, you know, a real challenge that I think that exists is just this supply chain one, the commodities and the obscuring between the distance from grower to brand. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting, different, get, getting different vibes at different times here. <laughs> Um, you know, I suppose, I suppose one could argue that uh, at the end of the day, if, if we get what we want, you know, who cares what motivates people? You know, if we're getting, if we're getting implementation and, of practices that, that uh, enhance soil health and so forth, uh, why, do I, why do I care what motivates, uh, what motivates that? But I am curious because uh, some vibes that I'm getting here, I, I would say that uh, you know, uh, your organization may be using this as a way to address, say, large-scale externalities like uh, air pollution, water pollution, you know, CO2 uh, emissions, and so forth. Other vibes I'm getting as well. You're using it. You could be used as a as a way to attack local on-site problems, nutrient inefficiencies, or uh, uh, in depletion or yield or whatever. And then, and then I get the vibe that, well, it's something the customer, in some cases, it's something that the customers want as part of branding and so forth. You know, help, me, help me balance these out for your organization. Is this a, a, a large scale externalities thing, a local problem solving? It's something the customers want. Is it all the above? How important, how relatively, how important are these? Or does, do we, should we just not, should I just, should you just say, Schaefer, it doesn't matter? Just it's actually all of the above, but there's a hierarchy. And that hierarchy okay. can shift from one situation to another. Mm -hmm. And I'll give an example, and this was one of the early breakthroughs in soil health had to do with soil's disease suppressiveness. And we had great programs this morning on it. Yeah. But it affected us directly. We started growing edible dry beans. In the first year we grew them, it was like printing our own money. It was such a profitable crop. 
by the time we'd been growing them for six years, they had root rot and the yields had dropped way off. And it was a case of do we drop this crop or do we figure out how to grow it like it used to grow? And by incorporating different species in our crop mix, by putting in cover crops and building up the soil health, we actually doubled the yields of the dry beans back. Now in that case, yield trumped everything because that made such a huge difference in our bottom line. Now, if, if the yield drop isn't that dramatic, then access to markets would be more important. Um, I think I tried to allude to this earlier about productivity. If soil health, it, so a farm is a business, and a business is selling, unless you can get a special niche marketing for quantity, I mean quality traits, but, but commodity businesses are selling on volume. Um, so yield matters and productivity matters, and I fully believe, and I'm sitting up here today because I believe that soil health is, good, is crucial to productivity, short and long term. It's also um, crucial in dryland farming to yield stability, which is right. about profit. So motivations equal fear and greed. <laughs> the standards. Altruism is helpful. You know, environmental sensitivity is nice, and, and, and in fact, a lot of people in this room believe in that too, as do I, but ultimately it's fear and greed. Mm -hmm. At its most naked, it's about how to, how to be profitable in a business level or how not to fail. And, and soil mm -hmm. health is both. And, it, and the importance of it, and our understanding of the importance of it, is growing. I really support your choice of the word productivity. The coffee shop talk is always yield. Yeah. And it's always mm. what the best So that's how to convert of. soil health into the yield talk is right. to talk about productivity. productivity. Yep. And that's profitability is the bottom line of productivity. You guys, fear and greed, good with that? Not so much. <laughs> 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 well, just from the standpoint that I, 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 <laughs> I do believe we're selling purpose. I mean, I, I think that um, as we see millennial generation, as we see new consumers' attitudes emerge, uh, human beings are complex consumers with multi-decision criteria when they make decisions, that we are telling a story. And we're telling a story to consumers. And how effective we are in communicating that is really going to be what allows us to hit our bottom line. So in some ways, um, it's still an emotional quality, right? Fear, greed, and now uh, you know, sense of purpose. Um, and very much tied to that business sense. I mean, the, 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 it is to, uh, the result would be higher brand health, higher connectivity greed. consumer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just a marketing angle. <laughs> Well, but without, uh, it's not very fun, though, to guide your organization. Didn't no, it's, it's, not, it's not inspiring. It's just true. Didn't somebody say greed is good or something? <laughs> well, but, but some consumers will choose experience over products these days, right? They'll, they'll rent an Airbnb as, a, as opposed to buy that new device, right? So there is a, there's a change in belief in terms of where those dollars go. And I think by putting a focus on purpose, I'm trying to, to, to connect with that new sense of consumer demand. Yeah, John? Yeah, I think it's really interesting right now. I think there's a, a deeply engaged set of consumers that is growing. It's a consumer base that's growing. And I think what they're trying to tell us as a big food company is that food isn't a zero-sum game. And there's clearly parts of food today that are all about fear and greed. And the market's sending clear signals on that. But as we look at the movements and way people are buying differently and what they're buying, to me those messages are about, I don't necessarily trust what I've been told for 20 years or 40 years with my brands. I'm not sure that everything about the system is putting the environment forward or putting my needs forward as a consumer. And I think there's an opportunity in that. And as I think about how soil health plays in there, right? Just the ability to talk about what does it do for productivity? Um, how does it make the food taste better, potentially? Uh, what does it do for um, helping to ensure that the business of farming um, is lower risk tomorrow than it was today? It's a powerful ingredient to add to the mix of, uh, of being in the food space today. All right, I'll tell you what. I, let, let me ask, ask one more. Um, and then we'll go to the audience. And this, you mentioned, you know, you, you dropped the term long term. 
And you mentioned the saying, well, people, people don't necessarily believe what they've been told for 20 years and so forth. There, there is a long, there's an investment aspect to this, I think. Um, you know, it's sort of like, uh, well, there are certain things you can buy uh, to improve employee morale, you know, but you're probably not going to buy employee morale off the shelf. You know, so you're not gonna you're not gonna invest. You're not gonna buy soil health and then reap environmental benefits and all that. You know, it's it's not gonna happen that way. It's a long-term investment. <clears throat> to what extent do you think it's that reluctance for that long-term investment? Is that a, is that an explanation as to why some are reluctant? Is it that is this 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 long-term risk? Um, how do you feel about that as a as a as a as an obstacle? This idea of, the, of investing in something that's long term. When I worked for ARS, we used to say that, oh, that people used to say, oh, ARS uh, does, how do, I, how do I remember this? Uh, uh, high risk, long term high risk research. And I always used to think, well, oh, that's a lousy investment. <laughs> you know, if you come to me and say, I've got an investment for you that's high risk and long term, I'm probably going to say, no thanks. But if you, know, if you said, well, if, if you make a sustained investment, there could be some, some high impact payoff for this. Well, I'd probably say, well, at least tell me more about it. Uh, how, is, that, is that psychology part of this? Or, or it, to the extent that you interact with your customers and people in your organization, is that, is that a factor, the long-term investment aspect of this versus short-term uh, benefits? I don't think there's a fear of long-term investment by most farmers. I think that's, that's sort of a, that's a mindset that they have in addition to an annual production cycle that's crucial for cash flow. So if the investment is detrimental in the short term in a significant way that's, that's unwise for short term survival, let's say I have a good friend, a neighbor that just converted or was attempting to convert to organic this year in the rain fed disease in a high humidity south. And he's an economic, he's PhD in um, agricultural economics and did all the research and, and very invested in it. And he, and he rented a tract of land from us and he wanted, man, I, I said, no, I, I, the rent will be minimal. I, I hope it works. I want to learn from watching and, and mm. you know, that's great. And he called me and he said, we're not going to, we're going to have to spray. We can't do it. The, it. You know, it just, we can't afford this year on this crop. It would have to be one of his crops. Hopefully he'll make it in some others because, and he was trying hard and done, anyway, short-term devastating effects to what was required for profitability to survive for the next year. So I don't think there's a fear of long-term investment. I think that the long-term investment can't be devastating in the short term or even harmful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I also think if the investment required, there's a two things. One is a practice change that has a dip in productivity before it has an increase. That dip can't be severe. The other thing, if it's an investment in a new machine or a new input or something that is too steep and difficult to recover in time to pay for it in a reasonable financial time. That is also a problem. Yeah. It's not about long, the long-term nature of it. It's about how, how, when, and when, how, and where to start and to do it where you can build into it. Yeah. Ryan, I see you nodding. Yeah, I mean, I'm just reflecting and seeing how uh, the parallel on a corporate side. I mean, there, there isn't a fear of a long-term investment. Uh, we have a project right now where we're, we're trying to implement renewables into our manufacturing supply chain in Mexico, signing a 10-year deal with a power purchase agreement, despite the fact that we, we might not, NAFTA might be challenged, right, and building provisions. That's something that leadership has bought into, but I think it's because the mechanism is clear, like the, the path and the trajectory. This is something that we understand. ROI with purchasing electricity, you know, the, the, uh, the grid, all of those things are very tangible. I think for our organization, uh, it's, the path is not clear when it comes to soil health, right? Um, how is, you want to engage growers, you know, tiers five, six, you want to do what with soil, right? So I think that um, with what metrics exactly and how are you going to update us? I, I think those are the challenges and stumbling blocks we have on brand. And then the big one is this, 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 the supply chain and the intermediary and the commodities that really struggles us from being able to, to reach down. But those challenges almost prevent sort of that investment. But inherently, I think long-term investment, it's well understood. John, it looks like you want to jump in, John. <laughs> okay. Nope. Miss read that. One. I can always talk. <laughs> let me, let me get audience. class and then we'll come back to you. Uh, part of the investment is the learning curve. 
and I, I think with soil health, uh, we can all agree we would like the outcome, we would like that payoff that you get from making that long-term risky investment, but there's the perceived high risk in the learning curve, and one of the reasons that the Soil Health Institute is so important is to do the research that takes the risk out of that learning mm -hmm. curve. You know, and then fear of the unknown is legitimate. Yeah. 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 With yeah. New yeah. I keep okay. amending my part. The, uh, <laughs> the a, a problem could be, and this again has been referred to, is a lease term. So if you farm leased Lease. land and are unsure mm -hmm. of the ability yeah. to retain it past a certain point and the investment doesn't pay off until after you may or may not still be responsible right. for that. So leased land is an issue associated with the long-term and the surety of uh, continued access. Any? Well, let's, let's go. Uh, yeah, I want, I want, what I'm trying to do, I want to, I want to save a few minutes for the very end and give everybody a chance to make one or two points. But let's, let's, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, the lights are really bright up here, so I'm going to have a hard time hard time seeing, so um, if people will work the microphones and maybe just go back and forth. Need my sunglasses, I guess. John and uh, Roy, and, uh, I, think, uh, I think the two farmers on the panel have done a good job, and, and, uh, and uh, Larkin's comment just a minute ago about on a, on a mindset is, uh, it is truly accurate. John, one of your competitors out in Denver uh, went out in the West and said, uh, we want to help uh, producers transition to, uh, you know, to uh, organic, but the criteria and the return was not there at all. And I don't think they understood the complexity not talking about mindset, not talking about change in thinking and perspective, not talking about uh, tenure with uh, leaseholders, just talking about, just talking about the, 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 uh, the details uh, they didn't understand at all. I guess the question I have for Roy and, and you, John, does corporate America, do you think the people at the senior vice president and president level, maybe even board level, really understand <coughs> the complexity of, of uh, soil health and plant health and the mind change, uh, the philosophy and, and the, uh, the uh, complexity of, of, uh, of switching over to that uh, and, the, and the time it takes. So 98% of the North American population is several generations removed from food and I would say that that's, or, or from the farm, and I would say that that's really true um, in most corporations as well. So do the senior executives at General Mills understand the complexities of what it takes to move from conventional to organic? No way. In fact, I spend a lot of my time trying to connect um, a, a, real, a group of really smart people on the fact that farming is not big gardening. Farming mm -hmm. is a business that operates um, with its own set of challenges, suppliers, and customers, just like we do That's in that mix. And there's commitment to figuring out how to get there. And where I see it in, in my organization is that um, we can put a demand signal out, but we know that's not always enough. So then we need to bring advisors to the table, maybe invest a little where we know we're gonna be in transition to lean in because we're gonna bet on the long-term growth of that particular space. Um, but no, these are very complex problems, and by and large, most people don't understand. And so for those that do, um, and those that take the time to understand, they can see the value of it really quickly. And I would just add, I think the role of corporate sustainability, I, I feel like I'm the internal salesman, right? Like I, I'm constantly, well, three decks a week, that's about what I deliver. And I'm usually always <laughs> describing something that is foreign, different, and just out of the box. And I think that after two years of driving that with some of the senior leaders, and I, I brought in a rancher that practiced uh, adapt, adaptive multi-paddock grazing, right, to, to speak to folks uh, who sell genes on the western side of the business. And um, the questions that you get are, 
what, what could I do with the grass at my house? You know, like, like it, they're trying to relate it. They're trying right. to understand. Yeah, absolutely. They, they have their own human element component. They have kids and they, they, they desperately want to know. But that, that learning curve, Klaus, that you were talking about, it exists just in the C-suite just as much as it does on farm. And okay. it's, it's a matter of, of continuing that discussion and dialogue relentlessly. <laughs> um, maybe it's more PowerPoints. Um, but, but not letting up on that educational process. And I, I think that it, it actually surprised me how, uh, for as old of an organization that Wrangler is, how open they've been to this, this transformation, this conversation. I, I thank you all. And I think it's good to close today with this panel because I think you're all spot on about your comments uh, across the board, either from producers all the way to the retailers. And especially that it grounds us in our, when we get very philosophical and high thinking, that we have to come back to the real world. Quit smirking. smirking. <laughs> but um, so this is good because it grounds us in what we need to do, where we need to go, and how it needs to be done. So thank you for that. Uh, you just mentioned education. This brings me to my question. Um, and can, through education or what other mechanism, can we change the perception or the perspective or the understanding of consumers, customers, because they drive all of this, whether they're going to buy who's ever jeans or organic products or whatever, they, they're running the show. And uh, as has been mentioned, the, the organic folks are going to buy organic because they have bought into that for whatever reason. The kid on the street is going to eat snacks and doesn't care about where it comes from or how it's grown or the nutritional value. So that product's going to be there. But is there an educational level that either you as uh, companies, corporation, or from farmers or from uh, folks like SHI that are trying to support some kind of change, uh, changeover, uh, will education of the consumers make this change and make mm -hmm. it valuable to them? Because if they don't value it, it's not going to happen. And I'll use a quick example of back in the, like it was it the 70s or 80s when, you know, the recycling thing. And kids at school will talk, well, you need to recycle, and this is a good thing. Before that, everybody threw everything away, but all of a sudden, everybody started recycling. Can we get that education to the general populace and make this relevant to them? Klaus, you're involved with organic production. Why don't you, what's, the, what's, the, what's your perspective on that? Well, there is a small group who is going to do it because they feel it's the right thing to do. But I think for the majority, if there's not something in it for them, that they're consume, there's going to be the majority of consumers are going to be very selfish. Now, if they see uh, the connection to climate change, or if they see that it tastes better, or if they think that they're going to not get sick, then they're getting something uh, for them. So mm -hmm. I think we have to, re just like we talk about fear and greed, <laughs> it's down to it. there, there's also a strong element of selfish to see in, on the other side. You know, and, and we have to satisfy that as part of the transaction. Yep. I think it's how colorful you are on Instagram, honestly. <laughs> uh, I think I the, agree, actually, I, I agree too. Right, I mean, there's yeah. this element where it doesn't matter sometimes what the message is, but it's the curation of the message. Um, I, I, I spent some time with some uh, videographers and they led me through these Instagram pages and showed me the color mapping that was going on and said, this is why this is successful. This is why this brand went from 12,000 subscribers to 120,000 in six months. I think we need to radicalize our message. I think we need to think differently about how we present it. I think that we just got done interviewing one of our key farmers in, in Athens, Alabama. Pretty exciting three days for us. We took a, a, a video of uh, a gentleman who's 70, 72 years old who uh, he spoke about how his kids were doing everything amazing with this technology which he doesn't know how to use. So we had this bright idea. Let's have him fly our aerial drone. And he said no for three days. He wouldn't do it. On the third day, we got him to pick up the remote and to fl fly the drone. And the smile on his face is what I'm hoping will unlock that connection to consumer. Uh, let's see. Where's, yeah. What's next? By Byron over here? Yeah. Um, Ken Greer from Canada. Uh, we uh, run Western Ag. It's a consulting company. So. An, a uh, question aimed at the growers and maybe 
it will uh, transition over. So there was a comment about the cost of learning, which is a significant cost, uh, opportunity cost lost, and then the time to learn uh, different management practices on the farm. Can uh, the two growers give us some perspective on the importance of consultancies in lowering those uh, learning risks? So hiring a, some sort of consultant, because inside of every business, when you're going to make a transformation, you usually look for the consultant that might be in that space. So I'd like to hear your comments on that. Um, I've had this conversation, not as it relates to soil health, but actually as it relates to precision ag, um, where I'm more often a panelist. I'm, this is my first soil health panel, but I've been on those more. One of the, and in that world, I, I, um, the parallel is not exact for, for soil health. The information about soil health, let me go back, the information about soil health uh, to farmers, in, at least in my experience, which is limited, um, has been coming from NRCS or a government agency or extension to the extent that it was delivered. And those are, um, the, the quality and, and energy in those systems varies around the country associated with the advice you get. But it was free. The same thing's happening in precision ag. A lot of that space is trying to be captured by input providers who are selling services to farmers and they're also selling them the things that, the, the inputs on the seed and fertilizer side in particular, which mm -hmm. goes to soil health. One of the issues for farmers, and I'm fighting it locally because I'm trying to create an, a, a, a business, or uh, theoretically would like to create a business locally for us around a neutral consultancy that's fact and science based where farmers realize there's value on a per acre. Three, five, seven, you pick a number, you have to get so many acres to pay to get somebody who's technically capable of helping you solve some of these problems. A lot of it be around fertility, a lot related to precision ag, but it would also go to soil health. But the farmers say, no, I don't need that. So-and-so tells me, gives me that for free. What they don't realize is that's a retailer or an input provider in some way that is not aligned with their interests. Yes. And so it's a challenge. I, I answer that question. I, yes, I personally think there's a market, and I think there's real value there, because right now I'm struggling to solve these technical problems <coughs> in my office. But, and I would pay because I'm spending time and energy that I would devote somewhere else if I could pay someone to do it. But I don't think that's well understood in the farmer community, and I think they think they have alternatives for advice that doesn't cost anything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real challenge for the industry. Um, yeah. I think soil health it has got this infrastructure that is um, rusty in certain places about delivery of this information, but delivering it to, to the farmer is the challenge a lot of you are researchers, and so you know a lot about specific technical areas. Um, and so the Soil Health Institute is in a great spot to pull lots of, of information and lots of geographies and lots of specialties into a usable format and then send it back out to the pieces and the partnerships that have the touch points. But those touch points are very local and they vary in quality. And so, yes, there's a huge role for consultants in general because they that's a nice touch point for well, but it's, a it's going to be a struggle. I'm on both sides of that issue where I do consulting, but I will still use a professional consultant. I think it's a very good expenditure of money if I'm getting the information, if I get a consultant who can give me what I need. Uh, it's, it's much better than me learning the hard way. The problem I run into as a consultant is I've got a lot of potential clients who want me to tell them how to keep doing exactly what they're doing and get a totally different result. <laughs> and that kind of a client is never going to be, it's never going to be a satisfactory relationship. The farmer has to be, if they're going to spend the money on a consultant, they have to know that they're getting a quality piece of advice and then have to follow it. And not everybody does. Yeah. Let's take one more question from the floor. We're over here. So I'm very pleased to hear from the brands. The, um the real um, high recognition about the economics and the value proposition for farmers. But I want to come back to a comment that Larkin made earlier, you know, about the supply chain and that kind of missing piece between the producer 
and, and the consumer. And I know in some of the sustainable supply chain initiatives, you know, there's ultimately sustainability goals and sustainability claims that can be made. So there's a lot of value being created, but thus far it seems to be really captured by the CPG companies and the retailers, you know, the consumer facing downstream end of the supply chain. How can that value be redistributed, you know, back upstream, you know, to the aggregators, to the producers, and even to the, mm. the uh, supply chain upstream of the producers, the, the input providers? Well, I think, I, I think the challenge that exists here is that um, if you're talking about straight food or, you know, regular conventional food, not organic, not natural, or I would even speculate the same in apparel. If you're competing on brand in sustainable or organic is not a differentiator, um, there's not that much money there to share. When you work across the chain, um, it's very competitive. Um, consumers, there is a very, very large contingent of consumers that want to buy in, but cost is an issue. Middle class is shrinking. People making less than $50,000 a year as a, a, as a demographic group is growing. Consumers care. Dollar store is growing, right? Because that's what people have to spend on a regular basis. So. It's a tough question. What I think is important is that as I think about what I heard today, I was blown away by the amount of science. And I know that the science has been there and the research is good, but I was really impressed. And then came this talk of how do we link the science and what we know to creating the economic models that give producers a chance to move forward with some level of confidence. That has to happen. Food alone is not going to drive this, and I just use the corn crop as an example. We grow about 15 billion bushels of corn in this country. Five of it goes in your gas tank. Five of it goes into cows. Two of it goes on ships to somewhere else. You put two of it in the grain bins. I think that leaves us with one. Food seed residual. We're not using a billion bushels of corn to make cereal and tortillas in this country. So if you think about who plays and who benefits from soil health? We all benefit. We have to find a way to get this back at Farmgate in a really credible way so that bankers can reward through cost of capital, farmers that want to invest in it, that the tax system can, can, invest, can reward this through accelerated depreciation, lots of different places to go. It's, it's tough. It's tough. But it has to be economic to create pull. Our clock just turned red, so uh, I, want, I, want to, I hope you'll indulge me for just a few minutes. I, I want to give each of the panelists uh, an opportunity to uh, any concluding thoughts, anything that you would like to have mentioned in the course of this that uh, just it wasn't an opportunity to do so, anything you want to say to wrap it up. Since I came this way the first time, I'm going to go, sure. go, to go back the other way, Larkin. I don't have a nice summary. I have a rabbit hole to jump down because it's a personal agenda for the meeting. <laughs> People that were in the can't, board meeting say, yesterday had no way. I can't say no to a board member. No, exactly. <laughs> I've already given this speech once. Um, and this is about measurement. And, and there was a lot of conversation. This, the, the Soil Health Institute is doing great work around that. This is a point made about the importance of reliable measurement for farmers. And a little experiment that I did for myself. We, I took a 231 acre field this past fall. And I, there are way too many variables. You scientists are going to criticize me 27 ways for this, so I understand that going in. But what we did, I, took, um, I hired a consulting firm, again, trying to test paying a fee for somebody else to do what we're doing on our farm. And they wanted to do 2.5 acre grids, which I disagree with, but I let them do it. And then we took the soil sampling like we've done, which we spend a lot of time and energy on, and we do management zones based on multi-year <laughs> yield map analysis and some of this precision ag stuff. So on the 231 acre field, I took, they took 92 samples, we took 29 samples. It was a well-sampled field by either measure. They sent them off to a well-respected commercial lab. I chose a different commercial lab. Samples were taken in the, by the same method in the same week, so not a lot of difference in moisture content or conditions or depth or anything else. The good news for me was that the average pH across 29 samples in one case and across 
92 samples in another case. The average pH came back relatively the same from the two labs. 6.4 in one case, 6.9 in the other. Feeling good about my pH. The measurable P, the average from one lab was 55. The average from the other lab was 92. That's statistically different. And I will behave differently if I believe one lab or the other lab in available P. K, the average for one lab was 147 pounds per acre. This is all in pounds per acre available. The other lab said I had 274 pounds per acre. I will behave and fertilize differently depending on which of those results I choose to believe. This last one is the worst. Organic matter, the thing soil health, is one of the major components of soil health. One lab gave me a range of 0.7 to 1.1% with an average of one, which is what I expected. The other lab said my range was 1.9 to 4.7 with an average of 2.8. I will behave differently depending on which lab I believe. Both of these labs, who will remain nameless, are perfectly viable, commercially respected labs. Measurement will matter in this process of soil health. And so, anecdotally, I can say there's work to be done, even on tier one, <laughs> having it done in a repeatable, trustable, <laughs> consistent way. So that's my closing on. Amen. Yeah. Uh, I, think, uh, what, I think what we all need to take away is how difficult this assignment is. Uh, we're, we've only been working on this for a few years, but the, the job at hand that has to be done is huge. There's a lot of science has to be, uh, a lot of experiments have to be done. A lot of investment has to be made, and a lot of ingenuity has to be used. And the urgency for doing it is equally big. So just because it's difficult doesn't mean we sh shouldn't attack it. I think even more important, we have to. This, this is a necessity for the future of our country and for the future of humanity, that we learn how to maintain our soil health. Uh, I would make a plea. Uh, scientists tend to be very careful, conservative. They move ahead slowly only as they know where they are. I don't think we can afford to be that careful. I think as farmers, we need to get out ahead and figure out how to use these tests, even if they're not quite ready yet. We have to start doing experiments and sending that information back to our scientists so that we can figure this out as fast as possible and start implementing it as fast as we possibly can, because this, this is a really crucial need that's being filled here. Uh, yeah, I was just a final thoughts of uh, gratitude. I, I think we're, we're really appreciative to be in this room. We're, I, I think I'm amazed at the conversation we've heard uh, this morning and, and, and that continues to go on with the Soil Health Institute and the community of folks that are, are addressing these issues. Um, we're learning from this conversation in a really meaningful way, and we're learning from our growing partners, and I think that the more that... Uh, that we experience as a brand and a, as a company, the more that we experience this discussion, this dialogue, the more that we feel um, connected and wholesome as, as, as a wider community. And this is, the, this is the message that we want to take to our consumers. You know, they're asking us, where are, is our product made? How is it made and where does it come from? And we want to answer that in a really meaningful way. We want to answer that in a way that, uh, that is values driven, that, uh, that really, uh, just amplifies all of this commitment to soil health and stewardship. So I just have a big thanks for, for this organization and for everyone that, that contributes to it. John? Yeah, and, and I'd echo the similar comments. I think the, the ability to participate you know, in an organization that has tremendous vision for where we need to go um, and is putting a stake out there for leadership um, is a great honor. And we're very supportive. You know, you've seen that. We've been on the board a up on the PowerPoint a time or two. Um, so much of this, to make it relevant and happen, it, it has to work in the business model. And when things work in the business model, they take off like wildfire. And I think for me, as I think about all of the work that I have to do in sustainability, and the teams I work with make the most progress, it's because they unlock the value in the business model that the science gives them an opportunity to find an answer to. And I think that needs to move along progressively with the science work that's going on. 
And if we can do that, every farmer in North America, who I believe are the, are the most innovative farmers in the world, will figure out how to put this to use really quickly and get after what Klaus talked about. So thank, thank you for the opportunity today. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I found this a very, very fast uh, hour and a half. I've just been amazed at how, how quickly the time has passed. This is the kind of conversations that could go for quite some time. And I hope that they, they do. I hope that uh, this is enough to uh, stimulate your conversations around the dinner table tonight. Uh, we have lots of opportunity to, to continue to talk and, and, uh, and think about these things. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the good thing about being the moderator is, is you, you, don't have, you don't have to answer any of these questions. It's great to cook them up, and it's great to get them from the field. But, uh, you know, you get to turn to the, to the folks uh, next to you. It's kind of like what I've often told people. I learned to play in the band so I wouldn't have to dance. And this is kind of the similar, <laughs> similar situation. I want to thank uh, the panelists. They've been really good sports uh, about, uh, about preparing for this. I gave them some of the questions in advance, but not all of them. Uh, of course, they didn't know your questions in advance. And uh, I think they've done a great job. So uh, I want to thank uh, John Wiebold, Royan Atwood, Klaus Martins, and Larkin Martin. Uh, would you join me in thanking them? For